do paleontologists know the sex of a dinosaur fossil? The quick answer is that they don't. However, some fancy techniques have been concocted in the last 30 or so years that have helped provide more solid answers on if a given dinosaur or prehistoric animal is a male or female. This also drastically changes depending on what group of animals we are talking about. It's much easier to determine the sex of more recent extinct mammals than ancient dinosaurs because in many cases there are living cousins and descendants of these ancient mammals with us today for comparison. Sometimes sexual dimorphism or the differences between the sexes is very obvious and pronounced. Male gorillas are far larger and more robust than females, but humans have the least amount of sexual dimorphism among the apes. Many reptiles with us today run the gamut of sexual dimorphism from the same giant male and tiny female dynamic of primates seen in tortoises all the way to species that have no sexual dimorphism because they are composed entirely of one asexually reproducing sex. One may want to jump to the conclusion that the species members with the most elaborate crests, frills, and horns are the males, while the more boring members are the females. However, there is no precise way to test this in long dead groups of animals that don't have any good modern comparisons. On top of that, it seems that a lot of dinosaurs didn't have drastic sexual dimorphism when it came to their bony protuberances. All Parasaurolophus tubicens have long tube-shaped head crests. All Triceratops specimens have a frill and three horns. In this case, perhaps these animals used sexual dimorphism in different ways, like fleshy wattles that don't fossilize well, or color patterns. Some Mesozoic candidates for sexual dimorphism have been presented over the years. Some reptiles and birds today need females with very wide hips so that they can comfortably pass eggs when they lay them. The males are free to have narrower hips. The same goes for many mammals, though often to greater extremes since eggs are consistently of the same general size and are smaller than live birthed fetuses. Tyrannosaur specimens have been presented as males and females due to hip width as well as robustness or gracileness. Neither of these traits have held up to scrutiny as quantifications for sex. The only accurate way to tell if a dinosaur is female is if their bones contain large stores of calcium, medullary bone. This means the animal was getting ready to lay eggs. The animal was storing extra calcium in the bone to use in the production of eggshells. This has been found in less than a handful of Tyrannosaurus specimens and a few other dinosaurs. Unfortunately, none of the other skeletal traits of these female dinosaurs made the sexual dimorphism obvious. So, they were not Rosetta Stones for sexing their given species or genera. One 2015 paper published by Evan Thomas Saita in the journal Plus One took a look at a bunch of specimens of the armored dinosaur Hesperosaurus and argued that the difference in the bony plates along their backs was the sign of sexual dimorphism that paleontologists have been looking for. The Judith River Dinosaur Institute is a commercial fossil outfit that has been hosting multiple digs each summer for over 30 years. They teach people how to do field work and are responsible for a huge number of important fossil discoveries. One of those was a bone bed designated the JRDI 5ES quarry that contained around five stegosaurs, which are now known as Hesperosaurus and nothing else, which is quite unusual. It was thanks to the inclusion of so many individuals that Evan Saita was able to observe a clear difference among them. It seemed that there were two different kinds of bony plates present among the group. Short, wide, dinner plate shaped ones, and tall, thin, spiny ones. Evan Saita measured 40 plates found in the quarry and those of known Stegosaurus specimens. Many of the quarry plates were broken, so Saita had to estimate their full size from the outline inferred by the broken edges, placing the data into two groups of complete and reconstructed plates. According to Saita, to observe variation in size and shape, he conducted a principal component analysis, which squishes down your data into two dimensions to make it easier to plot and find any structures within the data. 
He also did histologic analyses of the plates, which means he cut super thin cross sections through some parts of the plates, sanded them, mounted them on glass slides, and looked at all of the microscopic structures of the bones. The principal component analysis proved that there are definitely some Hesperosauruses with tall skinny plates and some with short fat ones. It proved there was a real difference. The histologic analysis found that the base of the tall plates was rough in texture and had more and deeper blood vessels snaking around the outside surface of the plates. So what does all this data collection mean? One hypothesis is that the plates belong to the two sexes. Another hypothesis is that the different plate types simply represent differences between individuals rather than broad differences between the sexes. Saita explains this is unlikely the case since there are no individual Hesperosauruses in the quarry or that have ever been found before this that contained an intermediate stage of plate types. There is no precedence for a wide range of plate types in this genus. Of course, that doesn't mean it's impossible. The next hypothesis is that the differences belong to one individual animal which is patently unlikely considering there are plates of both types that belong to the neck, back, and tail, as seen in other stegosaurs as well as other specimens of Hesperosaurus. Yet another alternative hypothesis is that the dimorphism seen in the bone bed is actually that of different species. Saita explains that this is probably highly unlikely because the skeletons of all individuals are nearly identical. The only major difference is the plates. If they were different species, you'd expect some differences in the skulls since closely related but different species tend to eat different things in order to avoid competition. On top of all that, the sediments that preserved the bones had to have been laid down by a very low energy current. The bones were not all in one direction, so they were not killed and buried by a fast energy event like a mass flood or mudslide. No scavenger teeth nor bite marks were present in the quarry and no bones of any other large animal were found. This group of Hesperosaurs died together all at one time and were slowly pulled apart by the action of the sediment that buried their bodies. The final alternative hypothesis Saita presents in his paper is ontogenetic variation. Ontogeny is the study of how organisms grow over their lives. Many critters change drastically as they age. Perhaps these differences in plates are really simply different age groups. This is definitely unlikely because the histologic analyses found that all specimens in the quarry were at least sexually mature animals. Some were larger than others, but none were babies or juveniles. Therefore, with all alternative hypotheses ruled out, Saita argued that the most parsimonious explanation of the plate differences in Hesperosaurus is that they belonged to the different sexes. This sort of ruling out of all other alternative possibilities had not been observed before this quarry, because most other dinosaur bone beds that have a lot of individuals of one species tend to have conditions that would allow for the possibility of alternate hypotheses. Unfortunately, there is still some mystery to this case, as no medullary bone was recovered from any specimens in the quarry. This means that Saita could not definitively assign either plate morph to a sex. Saita looked to modern bovid mammals as the closest possible modern analogs to find some sort of guess as to what sex had which plate. Bovids are large four-legged plant munchers with display features in both sexes that are made up of a bone core covered in keratin sheaths fed by copious blood vessels. Since males tend to invest more energy into their sexy displays, Saita speculates that the wide plate may have belonged to the male while the tall skinny plates belonged to the female. Interestingly, both sexes had these same types of thagomizers. Both sexes needed a way to defend themselves after all. The purpose of stegosaur plates has been debated to death for the last century or more. This case of sexual dimorphism proves that the plates had more than one function. The females still had plates, even though they were different. This could mean both stegosaur sexes were under sexual selective pressures to display to one another and natural selection pressures to defend themselves. Saita uses this case as possible evidence that many other dinosaurs that carried around bony structures used them for many purposes. Unfortunately for Saita's work, it may not be as clear-cut as it seems. 
Not long after his paper was published, paleontologists Kevin Pettian, then of the University of California, Berkeley, and Ken Carpenter, then of the Utah State University, provided some criticisms worth exploring. Pattian notes in a science article that there's no evidence the animal has stopped growing, and because the bones Saito found were in a chaotic heap, it's impossible to use any other bone, such as a femur, to figure out whether the dinosaur was an adult or juvenile at the time of its death. Pattian continued, It's very good that Saito considers other hypotheses, but his data, as presented, are not good enough to test any of them. Ken Carpenter noted in the same science article that Saita used stegosaur skeletons from the Athel Dinosaur Museum in Switzerland as a model to help sort out the jumble of bones dug out of the quarry, but many of the Swiss specimens aren't complete. Most of the back plates for those dinosaurs were never found, so their bones are crowned with replicas from other dinosaurs. So it could be that Hesperosaurus sported both round, large plates and long, thin ones on different parts of its back. Fossils like that have been found, a fact Saita ignores. I applaud what he's doing, but he's building on evidence that's rather shaky. That sounds like a lot of yikes to me, but Saita did clap back that he was well aware of the heavy reconstructions on the Swiss specimens, but that they could still be used because enough of the plates were found per individual to generally support his idea. Saita simply stood by his interpretation of the histologic samples of the plates, noting that the microscopic structures of those bones match the bones of known mature stegosaurs. The last issue involves the private collection of fossils, so if you're sensitive to those topics, I recommend skipping this part. Padian and others note that the specimens used in Saita's study were collected by the Judith River Dinosaur Institute, which is a private outfit. This means that the specimens are not in the public trust and may or may not be open to other scientists studying them. This means there is the possibility that no other researchers could ever objectively question Saita's conclusions or redo his experiments. Saita stated that the JRDI would keep these Hesperosaurus specimens publicly accessible, which may or may not be true at this stage, nearly a decade since the publication of the paper. I do agree with his critics here. Regardless of what the company might say they will do with the specimens, the possibility remains they could easily sell it all off to the highest bidder, lost to science. To play devil's advocate here though, many privately held specimens do eventually end up in public institutions, but you usually wait till that happens before doing a study on them precisely so that your results can be replicated. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.